jump ahead to our, our next presenter, Walter Payne. Um, Walter's uh, presentation is an, oops, sorry, I'm way ahead of myself here. There we go. Is an interesting one. Unexpected discovery. Now, I feel I should probably leave it at that because if I tell you anything more about what he's done, it will not be unexpected. So I'm not going to elaborate. But suffice to say, Walter uh, works at the space as a space intelligence analyst at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, and I will let you elab elaborate a little bit more on the background of your work, Walter. Now, just to verify, uh, we are making contact. Can you hear me? Are we there, Walter? Yes, I can. Can you Perfect. hear me? Perfect. I'm going to give you the screen and we will allow you to take it from there and find out what this unexpected discovery was. All right. Thank you, David. Things look good? Perfect. Yes, thank you. All right. So, hey, David, thanks so much. And I thanks Blue Marble for letting me do this. Um, just going to jump into this real quick. My bio, here's my bio. Um, I currently work for the Department of Defense as a space analyst, looking at uh, satellite activities and uh, things like that. Um, my background is really in geography, remote sensing. So, kind of going back down to earth. My, you know, despite what I'm doing now for, for my profession, kind of get back down to my roots, if you will. Um, real quick introduction here. Um, in February 2019. I uh, contacted uh, Ancient Origins after I noticed that they were going to have an expedition to uh, Columbia. And the expedition was set out to look at um, sacred mountains. And the primary focus was to look at, look for anthropomorphic forms on the, on the faces of the mountain. Now, I'm not a huge buyer of that. I think the more you look at something, kind of the more you, oh, yes, I do see that. that is, you're all right. That is a lion. That is a human head, what have you. However, um, on this trip, we made a interesting discovery that we just didn't anticipate, and that was a um, what's called a platform that the Muisca, the uh, ancient religion there, uh, said to have shamans on and uh, do meditations, and they were kind of aligned with uh, they, they were lined up with the celestial bodies. So let me jump into this. So this is all about kind of global mapper and how easy it is to use. I was very very impressed with how easy it is just to bring up the linking to world images and what have you and just import a shape file and you have everything right there in front of you, right? I know this might seem a little uh, basic to some, but just see, being able to show a map like this and zooming in, very intuitive, and it's very nice you have a scale down there at the bottom so you kind of know what you're dealing with as far as distances are concerned. And zooming in even closer to where we were. Now, right here you have Bogota listed in the center of the map. You can see that. And the place that we were at was Tabio, Colombia. That's where we were kind of headquartered at. Me and about, I think it was probably 15 or 20 other people set out on this expedition. And across the valley there at Tabio was the mountain range. Now, here's another zoomed in uh, view here. If you can see my cursor, our headquarters was, headquarters was probably about right here. And we were looking at the entire mountain range here. And one thing that caught Ashley Cowie's attention, he is a, uh, just real quick, he's a historian, and a Scottish historian, or actually just a historian in general. And um, he's from Scotland, and he lives uh, right here in town, and he's been doing a lot of research in the area. So what we did was we hiked all in the mountains here, and but there was one thing that kind of caught his eye one day, and that's just little flat area right here. I shouldn't say flat. You'll see in a minute it's definitely not flat, but this little barren area. And you know, again with Global Mapper, you can go in and create files, uh, shape files, very easy. And the other thing that I found very, very useful was the search feature. Oh my gosh, do you know how easy it is just to make a a point file from an address? That was wonderful. That was a very, very useful tool. So what I did was I took Phantom 4 Pro. You guys are probably very familiar with these drones. Um, I would like to say that this little guy is nothing but a powerhouse for what I've been using it in. I've been in various situations. It's, it's hit tree limbs. It's fallen down. Thankfully, the gimbal has not yet broken because that's probably the most expensive part to replace. But anyway, just a little kudos out to DJI. This is a really good little workhorse of a drone. So back to Global Mapper and using the drone footage processing, pre-processing, I learned real quickly that you don't really have great launch sites to fly these drones in. I, I like to have everything nice and flat, 
very calm winds. Well, you know, that's that's textbook for you, right? The real world does not, it just doesn't give you that opportunity, those, those types of conditions that often. So one thing that's good about uh, Global Mapper is you can import the, the images that you have and it shows you right here, you can see the extent of the, the, the area that you captured. So you can kind of get a good idea. Do you think you have enough good overlap? Did your, your automated flying software, uh, did it do a good job? Do you think you have a, good, a lot of good coverage? Because a lot of times in these types of situations, <clears throat> you're not gonna have a second opportunity to go back out there. So you really need to make that one shot count or hopefully the weather is permitting, you can get up and fly it again and just get extra overlap. So pre-processing, the pixels to point, that's within the LiDAR module of a Global Mapper, is a very good tool. And what I really like about it is, you can see over here on the right, right before I started pre-processed, or before I started processing, you can kind of get a layout of your images. It shows you which image you'd like to process. And here you can clearly see that the initial image from the software that I was using, it, it just takes a snapshot and gets kind of your your color balance, your exposure settings and whatnot. And uh, it kind of uses that for the flight. Now, you guys might realize that, or might think that, well, <laughs> but you're not gonna be taking pictures looking at the horizon like that, you're gonna be looking down. And that is a good, that is something that does need to be considered when processing the data. Um, but as you can see here, the points to, the pixels to points tool, load your images up in there. And if you wanna create a point cloud, you can go ahead and start doing that. Um, and, at, at this point, I was looking at the image size. I, I just wanted to use, I wanted to kind of get an idea of how long it would take to do this. So, in fact, the setting that I have here is not what I initially start, not what I used the first time. Instead, I used a setting of eight. You can see it over here processing the images now. Um, I used eight just to see how long it would take to, to map and if I had any holes in the data that they just couldn't get all the imagery to link up and, you know, morph into a good ortho pro, ortho photo. So as you can read right here, uh, doing a quick run, it reduced the image set to eight to allow a quick view of the area image. It took about two and a half hours to complete this. Um, after that, I looked at it and it looked fine. And let's go ahead and run it at, no, at full resolution. Well, the, the final resolution was approximately one inch. It took about 10 hours to, to process. Now, you might be wondering, did I process this out in the field or did I take it back to the headquarters where we were kind of camping at the time and process it there? Well, kind of stands to reason I'm not going to spend 10 hours processing the images. So I just, I did the uh, image size factor of eight there and just did a quick run back at the headquarters and process this. I think I even processed this information while I was flying back and just plug in the uh, computer whenever I hit a terminal or I hit an outlet at the airport and let it run. So the final the final product you can see part of it here. This is the uh, um, the point cloud, and it produced 90, 95 million plus points. That's a lot for this area. And about the thing the thing that I really want to hit on here is crop the image when you're done. Obviously, you want to save the process data and put it somewhere. But if you crop the data the data that you have, it's the the uh, computer was so much more responsive to just you know cutting down those number of points it has to plot out. Um, after all that processing, uh, you probably noticed back in the uh, points, uh, pixels to points, that you can go ahead and produce all these different products within there. So you don't have to go through and, okay, I clicked my, I've got my point cloud made now, let me go back and do a north node. Well, you don't really have to do that. You can even create models in there. So it's just a, it really is kind of just, point and click, I mean, uh, select and click, points, uh, pixels to points, that, that is very true in the nature of this process here. So among other tools in the uh, Global Mapper, Mapper is the, uh, the terrain um, cross-sectional area. Now, it's obvious that when you're trying to map uh, areas with a lot of trees and vegetation, you kind of do need LIDAR. However, we did not have, we, we did not have that opportunity. Uh, we were not afforded that type of system for this expedition. So imagery will have to work. Well, you can create point cloud, you saw that. So let's go ahead and try to make a 3D terrain out of this guy, right? To really see what we're looking at. Now here's a cross-section area 
of the part that we discovered. And um, you can see the starting point is here, which is over on this section right here, and it goes down. There's quite a little bit of a drop there, 60 meters, uh, ooh, probably about 70 meters or so in elevation. So you can see how sharp, how steep it is right here. And you notice right here is a is a level, and then there's another level right here. What I wasn't able to bring out was the notion was the fact that behind here at the start of this was a huge basin, probably about I'm going to say 15 meters in diameter. And what um, actually Cowie thinks of, thinks that was was a type of water, uh, a holding tank or or uh, something to contain water. Now, obviously, if we had lidar, that would be very apparent, but that's okay because we can still we can still pick apart the data here. Now, the other thing about Global Mapper is the ability to create uh, directional arrows. Now, what Ashley Cowley was concerned about is what direction is this platform oriented? What celestial bodies could it be attributed to? So, with that, he needs to know which directions you know. Uh, that that basin, that that central focus of that platform was with respect to what's called wakas, uh, these large stone uh, objects out here in the field. So with Global Mapper, you click on one, and it's rather intuitive. You go in and say you just want to point the bearing, have that included on your um, your vector line there, and you click to where you want to um, measure the dire the the direction to the bearing to the various objects. So this would be your source and a point out here, a point here, you just really go in and start clicking and you get all these wonderful little directional arrows here that can then be further uh, analyzed. So where it kind of comes all comes together, here's the entire area here. And, you know, you can go in and make custom maps. What do you want to show? What do you not want to show? Where do you want to focus things? And then you can just send that out to the customer or whoever you're doing this for, I assume still would be a customer, but then, then they can do their analysis off of this. So here's a quick video, and one of the wonderful features here is, you see how I can kind of, I'm focused on this area here, that's where that water basin was. You can see right here is kind of a, a, a level a level portion, and then it drops down into a water basin here. You can't, you can't see the whole thing here, but as the, I'll play the video in a second, you can see it actually start taking shape. So you have one level here, and then another level down here, and then you have the rest of the uh, the slope area down this way. Let me play this, and you can see it from there. And the g wonderful thing that you can do is you can have it focused on that particular area. So if I wanted to say focus on this particular tree here, I could just go in and point here. Whenever you do your fly through, after you make your the path you want to take, you just click here, and it'll focus on that tree and give you kind of the um, What's the word I'm looking for? Give you the the area surrounding that, so you can, can kind of put it all in context. Let me go ahead and finish that. But as it comes up here, you can see you can kind of see how you have a level here and a level here, and then right down in here is the basin. So very very good little video there, and you can see how much how varied the terrain is in this area. Oh, and real quick. Um, a little side note here, we did not know how to get to this area. I mean, when you look at the map, it's easy. You can walk on that all day, no problem. It's, I mean, you don't have any trees in this, oops, sorry. You don't have any trees in this area. Why not just walk up there? It's not that easy. Uh, I was really surprised. I've never been to the quote unquote jungle before, but I will tell you this, when you get inside the tree line here, you better be thinking not not 10 feet, not 30 feet in front of you, but you need to start thinking one foot in front of you because it is so it becomes so dense and there's so many vines, there's so much vegetation that you know you see movies about people just going through the jungle and hacking with a machete. Oh, this is easy. Hey, that looks like fun. I'd like to do that. Eh, it's not easy. <laughs> I just tell you that right now. It is not very easy to get through this type of, of vegetation. So that was a the platform there and now i went back in february and we came upon this or actually told me about this one site he says walter you've got to come out here and see this we've got we've got turtle down here in the lower right 
Well, it kind of does. I, I get it. It looks like a turtle. I don't know if it's natural. I don't know if it's man-made. There's something peculiar about that. There's no doubt. You can't, you can't deny that. Look up here at the top. You have a horned viper. Well, that looks pretty strange, doesn't it? That doesn't look like it, it should be there, so to speak. So I'm taking anthropomorphic, anthropomorphism out of the equation. All right, well, what's around this area? Show me. I want some science. You know, I want to, I want to go back with some facts. I don't, I don't want to have to interpret every little thing I see. I want to just say, yes, that is factual. That is what this is. So here's a video of the site. While we went up there, we just discovered that they were starting to clear away a lot of the vegetation, a lot of these trees um, in this area, maybe more so in Colombia in general than just this particular area right outside of Bogota, but it's eucalyptus trees, not indigenous trees at all. What we discovered was they are trying to eradicate or not eradicate, but just kind of, of um, marginalize, get, get rid of the non-indigenous the non-indigenous uh, vegetation there. So you can see these drag lines and actually as I was uh, shortly after I took this quick video of this uh, site, there was a, a, a horse that was coming down with a, a little sled attached to the back with a bunch of trees that was just going down and hauling out the trees that they were uh, use, that they were cutting down up on the hill here. So here's the area. I did the similar steps that I did for the uh, the platform. I used the similar steps in a global mapper, and this is kind of the ortho. It's, it's a very very coarse resolution one resolution one but the, it, it shows the area and this is right outside the, the town called chia that's a little bit closer to bogota than uh, tabio was in the map that i initially showed you at the beginning of the brief here so this is the actual ortho of the area now you can see it looks a little hilly a little terrain here's a map uh, another video of it and this was a very very crude video that i put together through global mapper but it shows you, I mean, just, just look at that relief. Look at all the vegetation. And again, the wonderful thing about focusing on an area, this is the area that I showed you of the drone footage, the actual video. And I believe I chose this one little monolith, so to speak, uh, as the focal point. You can see that the camera just focuses and rotates very smoothly along, along that uh, area of focus. It was a little fast going through there, but it's all customizable. So I said that, you know, I want to take out anthropomorphism, that type of stuff out of the equation. There is this little reflecting pool, little pool. I, we're, we're not exactly sure what it is, but it just so happens to be on the other side on the, let me think which side, I believe it is on the east side of the mountain range here at the same uh, little area where all these uh, stone features were. And it just so happens to be in a circular shape like Lake Guadavita. Now, I don't know if all you uh, South American historians know about El Dorado, but yes, that is where a lot of the Muisca would go and have, they would have ceremonies where they would uh, throw golden uh, trinkets, tenhos, as they're called, in, um, in the lake for ritualistic purposes, honor their gods, uh, have a good growing season, and what have you. This feature is about 28 inches in diameter. It's water. And I will say this, this is not a natural feature in this area. So now that leads me to suspect that maybe the features that we saw earlier are not natural either. It'd be really good to have a geologist out here and uh, you know take a look at these formations. So this is the area, again, zoomed in, and just a quick little area of interest, poly polygon drawn around the area. And, um, Really, what needs to happen is we really need to get LIDAR in this area. Right now, we're in an impasse. We can only do so much with optical. Global Mapper can pull apart all this information, but really what it comes down to is the data that you're trying to process, the available data that you need to use to get your the results your desire needs to be all um, uh, married together, and they have to be the right, the right, the right sources of data to get your results. So with that said, right now we're kind of at an impasse. This, this uh, research and investigation and exploration is by no means complete. It's, it's far from being complete. We don't know how big this area is. This could be a, um, a, a actually, actually call it the, the reptile, a reptile temple. Now, 
that's fine because all these features do kind of look like reptiles and what have you, but we don't know the extent. We do know that this is an access point to a, um, a sacred uh, path along this, this particular mountain range. We don't really know the extent of it though. So there's a lot more that needs to be done, but like I said before, we just got to get LIDAR up there. We don't know how to get LIDAR over in that area. We don't, we, none of us on the, on the research team have LIDAR. We just have little old drones that we just maximize the heck out of and use like uh, workhorses. So anyway, that, that kind of conclude, concludes my uh, presentation. If uh, anybody has questions, actually, before I ask a question, I just want to thank uh, Ancient Origins for the opportunity to go on this trip. And um, I want to thank Ashley Cowley for all the knowledge, the historical knowledge she has given me. It, it seems like I've kind of got the uh, technical side of this type of archaeological work or this type of exploration down. Now I'm going to have to delve into the uh, historical aspect, the uh, cultural significance of all this stuff. But this is wonderful work. And uh, I'll tell you this, uh, if we ever get the uh, LIDAR in that area, I think uh, there's going to be a lot of people that are like, wow, we had no idea that uh, this stuff was out there. So with that, thank you. And if there are any questions, I will gladly fill them if I can. Yeah, thank you, Walter. That, that's fascinating. I, I see a lot of uh, common threads here between between your presentation and Jeff. In fact, I think Jeff and, and you should, get, should, should chat sometime. I think you've got a lot of notes to compare in terms of the work you're doing. And indeed, as far as our presentations over the course of the day, there's a recurring theme here um, about the ability to process 3D data and what we can extract from 3D data, specifically point cloud data. So um, looking at some questions here, Walter, very quickly, again, we're uh, running a little sure. short. We will obviously make sure that whoever asks questions will be forwarded directly to Walter. Um, somebody's interested in the height of the flight. Um, we saw those uh, picture points rendered on uh, on the area of the area of interest. Um, somebody wants to know how high you were flying. How, has, how high was the drop? Yeah. Well, you know what? Let's go back to global mapper here real quick. And it looks like the one for that platform here, it's uh, relative altitude was 75 meters. So again, you know, you just go back and look at all the data that's already been loaded into the uh, little work file here in global mapper and you can kind of get a lot of that information. And to, just to follow up on something Walter mentioned earlier, when he showed us those little picture points, they're clickable. You can actually click on the picture point and it'll pop up the image in whatever your default image viewer is yeah. on your machine. You can also render with the latest build, actually the previous build, version 21.0, you can actually render the footprints as well. So you can actually see before you start processing uh, the footprints of the images and you can actually see very clearly what your overlap is. That's another function that's available in our wonderful to point tool. So. Um, Let's see, um, someone is asking how long did it take to fly the platform area and how many images were collected? That's part um, of the process. Yeah, I think that was, you know, that battery lasted, uh, I think that I, I bring it in at like 25 minutes or, or 20 minutes. I'm always paranoid about that, but I think that was a very, very quick flight. It was probably only about 12 minutes, maybe. Well, I could count here the images. I think it was like 68. And uh, it didn't equate, the, the actual area of interest was only about 16 acres that we really, that we kind of just really wanted to focus on. Okay, okay, excellent, excellent. Well, um, Walter, thank you so much for taking the time to share this with us. This, is, this has been fascinating. Uh, someone is asking about recordings. I've, I've had a few questions about recordings. Uh, obviously, a lot of our pre presenters are going through their content uh, relatively fast because of our limited time. Uh, absolutely, this is being recorded as we speak. These will be available to everyone who registered, whether you attended today or whether uh, obviously you haven't been here for the whole day. We'll give you all of the recordings of these presentations, so uh, including Walter's. Uh, thank you so much, Walter, for for absolutely. Time. Well, hey, I just I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to get this out. This is by far this is nowhere near complete. So thank you guys. Well, we'll, we'll have to have you back when it is. We we want to hear sure. the full story when it's completed. Sure. Thanks, Walter. Thank you.